Our reading this morning will be from uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 22. If you'd like to follow along, Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 22. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Well, that was an encouraging and uplifting reading. And that's something I've been faced with for the last several weeks, knowing that this day was coming when we would examine the woes of Christ to the scribes and the Pharisees. How do I make this positive? How do I make this uplifting? How do I make this encouraging? There are some parts of the Bible that are just hard to read because of what is being said. And what is being said is simply a truth in light of the way that people were behaving, specifically the scribes and the Pharisees. If we do not behave like scribes and Pharisees, then this particular passage of Scripture will be but a warning for us not to ever behave like they did. But if they do, if we do behave like the scribes and the Pharisees, then this passage has a particular meaning to us because we want to heed the warnings that Jesus was pronouncing on this day. Today, we are going to embark upon a two-week study of the seven or eight woes that are found for us in Matthew chapter 23. Now, the reason that I say seven or eight, and if you look in your Bibles, you might just have a heading that reads the eight woes of Jesus. That's because seven times Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Three of those are mentioned for us in today's readings in verses 13, 14, and 15. But then in verse 16, and different from the remaining four that we're going to take a look at next week, in verse 16 he says, Woe an eighth time, but he says it a little differently. Instead of calling them hypocrites, he calls them blind guides. They were leaders after all. The people looked up to them and they wanted the people looking up to them. But they in fact were blind guides themselves. As Jesus would say on another occasion, it's like the blind leading the blind. So this morning we're going to take a look at the first half of this series of woes that Jesus pronounces on the religious leaders of the day. And I tried to figure out just exactly how will I title this lesson. And I was, for the first time in a long time, rather proud of the title that I gave this lesson. So proud, I did something I never do before. I shared it with the teenage class this morning. I shared with them the title, Whoa, 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 Part 1. You know... Sometimes you can come up with a, a lesson title that has maybe an alliteration, maybe it uh, has some kind of simple way of saying it, but interestingly enough, I actually very much like that title because of the redundance. 
because of the sad fact that Jesus had to say, had to pronounce, had to deliver so many woes on this one occasion to the people who should have known better. So maybe we'll remember just a little bit better this particular lesson and next week's lesson, if no other reason but from the title, Woe Times Eight, Part One, from Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 22. Before we get into the main points of the lesson, let's make sure that we understand the word woe. Uh, some people may look at that and understand it by different meanings, but let's make sure we understand it from the biblical context. If you were to take a look at several different sources to find out its meaning, you would find out, for instance, from Strong's Greek and Hebrew Dictionary, the word woe is described as a primary exclamation of grief. Nelson's Bible Dictionary adds to that grief by defining it as deep sorrow, grief, or affliction. So what we are dealing with here is Jesus' deep sorrow Jesus' grief and Jesus' personal affliction by the constant barrage of the scribes and the Pharisees to dethrone him as they attempted to elevate themselves. And he is so sad that people who actually know the Scripture as well as they do do not practice the Scriptures any better than they do. He is deeply disturbed. And so he pronounces these woes. Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words describes the word woe as an interjection uh, used in denunciation. An interjection from a grammatical standpoint are those words that we just kind of, it really doesn't have a grammatical function in the sentence other than exclamation. So for instance, you might say, hey, or maybe you hurt your finger and you go, ouch. Well, the word woe is that interjection, woe. Not from the standpoint of stop, like we might say to an animal, but we, he is saying, whoa, this is serious. Caution, warning. Where you are headed is disastrous. Listen to the words that I'm saying. When we say that it is an interjection used in denunciation, I felt the need to make sure we understand what denunciation is or to denounce someone because that's not simply speaking against someone or calling someone out. It's done so in a public way. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines denounce as to pronounce especially publicly to be blameworthy or evil. The scribes and the Pharisees throughout Jesus' ministry were constantly trying to cause trouble for him. And they were not always doing this secretly or privately. Maybe their scheme, maybe their plans were developed in secret and private, but they were constantly in public situations trying to make Jesus look bad, trying to stump him, trying to trap him so that the people could see him as not so great, so that the people could see him as not so perfect. And in so doing, they would bring him down and hopefully elevate themselves. Because they took their sin public, Jesus addresses their sin public and he denounces them as a result. He denounces them with eight woes, four of which we are going to take a look at right now. I want us to take a look at the first four woes that are mentioned in our text and I want us to really look at them from the standpoint of just exactly what is Jesus saying. Because sometimes we read this and based on your translation you may get a little bit lost as to, as to their meaning. So I've kind of rewritten these a little bit to put it in maybe some common terms that we would understand just a little bit better. In verse 13 of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is basically saying to these religious leaders, you refuse to enter into the kingdom yourselves. And you are preventing others from going in as well. You are 
actively involved in this. You stubbornly refuse to acknowledge the truth that is facing you, that is standing right before you, and you are doing everything in your power to keep others from understanding and accepting that truth as well. I want you to realize where this is taking place. Because according to Matthew, if you go back several weeks in our study, back to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23, you'll find out that Jesus is in the temple. And Matthew has not described any change in Jesus' location. So here they are in the midst of the most holy place that the people would have considered in that day and age in Jerusalem, in the temple. And here Jesus is calling out on the carpet publicly the religious leaders, the preachers of the day, and he's saying to those ministers, you are not involved in doing what you say we ought to all be doing. And you're actively involved in preventing others from doing the same. What do we know about the scribes and the Pharisees. I want you to remember, go back all the way to Matthew chapter 3 in our study. You might remember John the baptizer, the preacher that was so popular with the people that everyone from Jerusalem and all the surrounding area were coming out into the wilderness where he was preaching and he was baptizing them left and right. And guess who shows up as well? The Pharisees. And in verse 7 of chapter 3, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now I want you to think about that for just a minute because although most of the baptisms I've been involved with were after hours, I've never had someone come down to the front row of the assembly during a worship time, request to be baptized, to which I responded, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, wouldn't you think fleeing from the wrath to come would be a good thing? But John asks it like, who warned you? Who told you about that? Because John, inspired by God, understood their heart, understood why they were there, uh, they were there to be about the same reason they were there for, throughout Jesus' ministry. The same reason that they were responsible for having so many followers of Jesus persecuted. He goes on to say, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you leaders of the people want to be genuine and you, you say that you're here for genuine salvation, then demonstrate it by your actions. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't just say you're sorry. Demonstrate your godly sorrow with repentance. And he says in verse 9, Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. Don't say that just because you are genetically from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you have any advantage over anybody else. Genetics will not get you into heaven. Who your parents were, who your grandparents were, who whatever relative you have was, that's not going to aid you. Abraham was a righteous man, but he was righteous because of what he believed and because of how he obeyed. And if you want to be like Abraham, you've got to follow in his footsteps. In verse 10, John would say, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. The leaders of the people... These religious men of the day had a reputation for saying one thing and doing something else. In fact, Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Remember, there's nothing wrong with doing righteous acts in front of other people. In fact, we're called to do that very thing. We're to be lights in the world. We are to be the salt that influences and, and has an impact on those around us. But what Jesus is saying is don't do those things just for attention. Don't do those things just to call, cause people's eyes to be upon you and then rather than glorifying your Father in heaven, somehow hope to reap the reward of glory upon yourselves. That's what the hypocrites did. He said don't do that. 
In fact, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 52, in Luke's account, Jesus would pronounce a woe in this passage of Scripture. He'd say, woe to you lawyers. Now once again, this is not a knock at attorneys. Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago. The type of lawyers that we see in the New Testament times were people who knew the law, specifically the law of Moses. So they were the experts. They were the people who had spent much time in study. They had gone to school to learn and to have a greater understanding. We might call it today they were in full-time work. And therefore they had the, t the time, perhaps more than others, to really dig deeply into the text so that they could teach others. Well, in Luke 11 and verse 52, to these teachers of the law, woe to you lawyers, Jesus said, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. And you yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. I want to read to you what one commentator wrote about verse 13. He said, they shut it up, the, talking about you shut up the kingdom of heaven, they shut it up by teaching false doctrines respecting the Messiah, by binding the people to an observance of their traditions, by opposing Jesus and attempting to convince the people that he was an imposter, thus preventing many from becoming his followers. Many were ready to embrace him as the Messiah and were about entering into the kingdom of heaven, that is, the church. But they prevented it. And Luke said that they had taken away the key of knowledge and thus had prevented their entering in. That is, they had taken away the right, the right interpretation of the ancient prophecies respecting the Messiah and thus had done all that they could to prevent the people from receiving Jesus as their Redeemer. To the leaders of the law, to the scribes and the Pharisees, to these hypocrites, remember, it was not all about God. And as such, it was definitely not all about the Son of God. It was, in fact, all about themselves. And they didn't want anybody to know that. But Jesus who was God in the flesh, was not fooled for a moment. He knew their hearts. He knew their thoughts. He knew the inconsistency of those thoughts and their actions. And what he said to them was, woe. Let's take a look at the next woe that is mentioned to us in verse 14. This is the part where Jesus says, you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive a greater condemnation. What, is exact, what exactly is he saying? Well, he's saying you're taking advantage of the vulnerable. And then you turn around and you try to appear to be righteous as if you've done no wrong. And it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you dearly. I want you to look at that first passage of Scripture. It's very interesting. This morning in the teenage class, we were uh, studying Acts chapter 6, talking about the problem that was facing the early church in the feeding uh, of the widows, the distribution of food to the widows. And we talk about those seven men uh, who are full of the Spirit and of wisdom who were appointed to make sure that these individuals were taken care of. God has always had a very special place in his heart for widows. And gentlemen, I want you to understand that although when a man loses his wife, he is a widow, we call him a widower, the Bible has a special emphasis on women. And that is because for so long in our world, even up to this day, in many places, including areas of our own society, we have lived in a male-dominated world. I was talking to the young people about how there are times where women have not been able to vote. Women have not been able to work a job. Women have not been able to own property. And as such, they were so extremely dependent upon a man. And I talked about how the Apostle Paul talks later in the New Testament about this idea of taking care of widows. Now, young widows need to do certain things to take care of themselves. Older widows, the family, the kids need to take care of them. As I said to the young people, your parents took care of you uh, for 18 plus years. You take care of them if necessary. And sometimes to widows who don't have any family at all, that's where the church steps up 
and takes action to make sure that they are in good shape. Widows and orphans have always been dear to the heart of God. That's why you go back into the, into the Old Testament to Exodus chapter 22 and verse 22. God says, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. Don't cause trouble for them. They're special people. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 17. You shall not pervert the justice do an alien or an orphan, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. We're probably familiar with the idea of a down payment. Well, let me tell you something. A widow, especially in olden times, not perhaps modern day United States where we are blessed in so many ways and we have so many resources at our disposal, but sometimes the garment, the, the coat off of a woman's back might have been the only thing that they possessed. And the, the problem here is don't take what little they have as a down payment just to secure your investment. That's not how God wants you to treat these people. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. These people who have lost parents, orphans, spouse, widows, these are the people that we stand up for. These are the people we fight for. These are the people we defend and plead on their behalf. There's little wonder why James, the brother of Jesus, in James chapter 1 and verse 27, describes, defines pure religion as this. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Pure and undefiled religion is to take care of the helpless, not take advantage of them. I want you to think about that. If pure and undefiled religion is to take care of widows and orphans in distress, you realize that impure and defiled religion, the quite the opposite, is when you neglect both orphans and widows alike. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5, Jesus said, When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. One of the things about the woe that we find for us in verse 14 is not only are they taking advantage of the vulnerable, but then they turn right around and it says, as a pretense. Uh, to suggest otherwise. Their heart is dark. Their, their thoughts are evil. Their intentions are wrong. And yet they turn right around and they offer big prayers, big long prayers, just to get attention. Now once again, let's be clear, offering a prayer publicly is not a problem. We certainly wouldn't have a problem in this forum. And when you go out to eat lunch, Later, if you happen to be at a restaurant, uh, there's not one thing wrong with saying a prayer there. In fact, of all the years that I have offered prayers in restaurants, I've never had one person say anything critical of me, and I have had people, strangers from the community, who have said to me, it's good to see people still pray. But when you pray, don't stand up in the restaurant and say, may I have your attention? I'm about to lead a prayer because I want you to see how holy I am. That's pretty much what we, these guys were doing. And they did it for a long time. And once again, length is not the issue. Brethren, we all know, and perhaps we know and react in a poor manner. We shouldn't. But we all know that there are some people who step up to the podium and when they lead the prayer, we pretty much know that that prayer is going to be over within 30 seconds. And then there are some people we wonder if it'll be over in 30 minutes. That's the wrong attitude to have. We need to quit being clock watchers. We need to quit worrying about time when someone is giving his gift to God and leading us in that blessing. 
we need to focus on what we're here to do. And if somebody comes up and leads a heartfelt prayer, then we need to, with the same heart, join in with him. But that was not what these hypocrites were doing. They were doing wrong and then turning around and trying to look all nice and shiny and polished for anyone who would watch them. Jesus says to that, you're going to receive greater condemnation. You're going to, have, you're going to be held to a higher standard. Why? Well, maybe it was because they were, after all, the leaders. Self-imposed many times, but they were the leaders. They purported to be the teachers. And I want to remind you of something that James wrote in James chapter 3 and verse 1. Not let, he, let many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that such men will incur a stricter judgment. It's kind of a scary thing if you happen to be a preacher. It's kind of a scary thing if you happen to be involved in teaching people. And yet all of us are called to be preachers. All of us are called to be proclaimers of the gospel, to teach those, to give a defense of the hope that we have. That is the responsibility that all of us have. But realize that when you take your faith and share it with someone else, now you're taking the souls of two people into the balance. And you want to make sure that you do the best you can to present the truth according to God, not according to self. What was the third woe that was mentioned? We see this in verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte or one convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Brethren, that's not a pleasant comment. What's he saying? Here's what he's saying. You will go anywhere and do anything, maybe even spend any amount of money to create one convert to yourselves. Remember, they're not converting people to God. They're certainly not converting people to Christ who they don't accept as God. But you'll go anywhere and do anything to create one convert for yourselves and he is going to end up twice as evil as you ever were. How does that work? How does that work indeed? I want you to consider something. Remember the principal definition of the people that Jesus is addressing. In Matthew 23 and verse 23, earlier in the chapter, Jesus says, Therefore all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They were not practicing what they were preaching, but Jesus was saying, listen to what they're saying, because they do know the law, and, and generally speaking, they're right in what they're saying, but they're not following through themselves. They want you to do all the work, but they're not willing to do it themselves. So we're dealing with textbook definitional hypocrites. What happens when somebody who is evil creates a convert to evil versus someone who is good who tries to convert someone to good? Well, I want to take the latter first, and let's look at that for a moment. Isn't it true, those of us who are Christian parents, isn't it true that we want our children to grow up to be Christians as well? And is it not true that you and I want them to be better children of the faith than we ever were? You know, we got to announce the blessing uh, just a couple of weeks ago that Connor, our youngest son, uh, was now the pulpit preacher, while going to school, he's the full-time Sunday-only preacher for the Tiplersville Church of Christ in Tiplersville, Mississippi. But you know something? What you may not know are all the conversations that I have with Connor throughout the day and many of them throughout the night when he calls me on the phone concerned that he's not praying enough, concerned that he's not studying enough, concerned that he's not doing enough for the Lord. Brethren, I wished I had the faith of my son when I was his age. I'm excited that his faith has and is growing in that fashion. But do you realize that if you actually embrace evil and then you raise your children in that way, it's just possible that those children are going to turn out not as bad as you are, but worse I want to consider you to consider something that Albert Barnes writes concerning this 
these people becoming twice the child of hell as the scribes and Pharisees. Albert Barnes writes, that is twice as bad. To be a child of hell was a Hebrew phrase signifying to be deserving of hell, to be awfully wicked. The Jewish writers themselves say that the proselytes were scabs of Israel and hindered the coming of the Messiah by their great wickedness. The Pharisees gained them either to swell their own numbers or to make gain by exhorting their money under various pretenses. And when they had accomplished that, they took no pains to instruct them or to restrain them. They had renounced their superstition, which had before restrained them somewhat, but the Pharisees had given them no religion in its place to restrain them, and they were consequently left to the full indulgence of their vice. When I, by thought, word, and example, demonstrate to my children that I want them to be Christ-like, I pray that they will not only be Christ-like, I pray that they'll be better than I am. But when I am full of evil, which is the absence of Christ, the absence of godliness, when I am full of evil and I then go out and try to receive somebody like myself, what am I giving them to fill their void of evil themselves? Nothing. I'm simply exacerbating the problem. I'm exponentially multiplying that potentially, and we certainly see that in various people in the Old Testament. You see that in the days of Adam to Noah, where people just went from bad to worse. And I want you to consider something, maybe a story you don't recall, but there were two kings, a father and a son, in the book of 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 33, verses 20 through 24, a father by the, by the name of Manasseh and his son Amon. These were kings of Judah during the time of the divided kingdoms. And just shortly before they're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to see a lot of the problems that they face, uh, in verse 20 we read that Manasseh died. It says he slept with his fathers and they buried him in his own house and Amon his son became king in his, the, in his place. Now listen to this description. Amon was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh his father had done. And Amon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had done. And he served him. So, so far, like father, like son. But now listen. Moreover, he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father, had, as his father Manasseh had done. But Amon multiplied guilt. And finally his servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house. So we've got a father who was bad, but did some things right at some times, but his son just goes worse. And in fact, he's so bad that his own servants kill him right there in his house. This is what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing in the first century. They were creating converts to their own religion. They were creating converts to evil, to hypocrisy, to the woes that Jesus was pronouncing upon them, they were now bringing others to receive that same judgment. You know, I think about a convert in the New Testament. And I just say this very, very quickly. I've got the passages of Scripture on the board behind me. You can study this a little bit later. But in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Acts 22 verses 3 through 5, Acts 26, verses 9 through 11, we read about a fellow by the name of Saul, a man who persecuted the church, a man who had people arrested, thrown into prison, gave approval that they be put to death. Why? Because he thought Christianity was the wrong thing and he thought Judaism was the right thing. But he was under the law of Christ at this point in time. The old covenant had ended and the new covenant, the law of Christ, had been put into effect. And as a result, after all the evil he did against the Lord and his church, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, when he now has become Paul the apostle, he has repented of his sins, been washed in the blood of the Lamb, he makes this statement. He says, regarding all the things that I did, he said, I'm chief among sinners. In other words, I've done as much or more than anybody. But then what's interesting is in Acts 20, verses 26 and 27, to the elders of the church at Ephesus, he said, but let me say this to you. He said, I am innocent of all men's blood. In other words, I've been washed clean. 
I truly converted not from evil to greater evil, but I converted from evil to goodness. I followed in the footsteps of my Lord. I listened to my Savior, that fellow Jesus who came to me on the road to Damascus and asked me why I was persecuting him. I became his servant and I've served him faithfully to this day. Paul would even say, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose or the whole counsel of God. We want to make sure that we get things right when it comes to truth. But we also want to make sure that we share that truth as God would have it with others so that they can be sons of God rather than children of the devil. The fourth woe that Jesus said really begins in verse 16 and goes down through verse 22. Now, I'm not going to read all of that. We read that a moment ago. But I want you to look at verse 16 where he says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is, is obligated. We start seeing uh, some conditions that the Pharisees have made, some little rules that they've imposed upon the people. And they're saying, basically, there are certain things you can swear to and certain things you cannot swear to, and although God's not commented on any of this, we have, so t do what we tell you to do. What does that mean? Here's what it means. You leaders value gold over God, and you swear to convince people otherwise. Now let's make sure we understand this, because all of us have heard... Uh, I remember hearing it as a kid, uh, especially among other kids. Somebody would say, I swear that's the truth. And somebody would go, oh, you're not supposed to swear. Well, that's true and that's false. It's according to what's going on. There's nothing wrong with swearing an oath, for instance, uh, giving your word to something. God himself did that. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 5, God swore an oath to Abraham. Uh, we read, it is, not your, it is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you and in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God swore oaths to all of these men saying that the promised land would be theirs. God swore other oaths in the Old Testament. But all he was doing was confirming the truth of his word. The problem with this is twofold. When people swear or give their word a word that is based upon a lie, something that is dishonest, something that is deceptive. And then the problem is when you have it where they're then turning around and using terminology to trump up the believability of their lie. We have people today who say, I swear on my mama's grave. And if you've watched enough movies, you'll find somebody who will say that, and somebody says, I thought your mama was still living. Well, he, she is, but I just, you know. Somebody will say, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Very painful thought. But they're doing that to get you to believe something. Here's what's interesting. I want you to consider several things the Bible says. First of all, those people who say, I swear by God that this is the case. If that's nothing more than a lie or a deception and they're trying to get you to believe it by invoking the name of God, you have to realize that Old Testament or New Testament, that's something that's not going to pass. You might remember the third commandment in Exodus 20 and verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. When you do something like that, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking it in vain. Leviticus 19 and verse 12 reads, You shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Jesus would turn right around and use those same principles in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 through 37, and he concludes that passage in verse 37 by simply saying this, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Some of you remember the time and you miss that time. I don't remember that time as much, but I guarantee you I miss the time where a man's word was his bond, 
where you didn't have to have every single contract signed and everything dotted and, and even then it had to go to court to have somebody else figure it out for you because you just weren't being true to your word. A handshake. A yes or no. That's all you needed. And that's all Jesus asks. Be honest. And be honest to such a point that your reputation is known to be this. That when you say you're going to do something, that guy's going to do it. When you say you're not going to do it, that guy's not going to do it. But be it known as a person of your word, a person of honor. You remember in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. Why? Verse 13 says, He said to them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, and you are making it into a robber's den. This is what the Pharisees were doing with some of this terminology. They were saying you can, uh, uh, you can swear by the temple, which was the holy place, but just don't swear by the gold in the temple. And he goes on to use all these other different illustrations as to just exactly how that works. There are things you can do and things you can't do. Things you should say and things you shouldn't say. Not because... God had spoken on that. In fact, as Jesus points out, their priorities seem to be out of whack. But rather, you need to give honor where honor is due. And you need to glorify God above all. Don't value God. Don't value gold. Don't make up rules that say you can say this when you really can't. Just be people of honor. People of truth. Realize that what we say is important. Maybe that's why Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know what he's saying there? Say good things. Do good things. Give God the glory. That's how that's summed up. And that's what Jesus was wrestling with, with the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites, the blind guides, people who would say one thing and do something else, who would think one way and act differently. They were inconsistent, expecting other people to serve them rather than they themselves humbling themselves and serving God first and others second. Where are you this morning? Are you the kind of person who tries to think good things, say good things, do good things? Or is there an inconsistency in there? Brethren, one thing's for sure. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. But brethren, let's don't get caught up walking in the footsteps of the scribes and the Pharisees. If that's where we are, let's make a change. And if we can, let's strive every day of our lives until God calls us home to walk in the footsteps of His Son, to follow that perfect example, to say the things that He would say, to do the things that He would do, and to live in such a way as to always give glory and honor to our Father who is in heaven. If you're not a child of God this morning, if you've not put on Christ in baptism, there's no better time to come in contact with the blood of Christ than right now. And as is the case with many who are here, you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit maybe years ago, maybe decades ago. And you are trying to walk that walk. You're trying to walk in the light as He is in the light. And that's what we're striving to do. But maybe there's someone here this morning who has fallen short in that area. Maybe you got sidetracked. Maybe you stopped thinking less of God and more of self. Here's an opportunity to make it right. With a penitent heart, go to your God in prayer with Jesus as your mediator and ask Him for forgiveness with that penitent heart. And if there's something we can do, as always, we stand so ready and willing to help. Uh, we want to know how we can. Maybe we can pray with you or for you regarding a matter of sin, but maybe there's a family problem, a friend problem, a job problem, some way else that we can help. We just need to ask you to please let us know how we can so that together we can lift up our cares and our concerns to our Father in heaven. If we can help you in any way this morning, 
We don't want to be like the scribes and the Pharisees. We want to be like our Savior. If we can help you in some way to do just that, let us know how we can. While together we stand and sing.